Hey, good day, everyone. I'm Dr. Erin Mikos. I direct Women's Cardiovascular Health Research, and I'm the Associate Director of Preventive Cardiology at Johns Hopkins University. And I'm really pleased to be joined for this recap with Dr. Eugenia Janos, who is a professor of cardiology at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra University. And she's the System Director for Cardiovascular Prevention at Northwell Health. And she's also Director of the Women's Heart Program at Lenox Hill through the Katz Institute of Women's Health. So she's a known expert in lipids and women's health. And so we were really thrilled to have her be a faculty member in our program. We recently returned last month from our second annual um, cardiometabolic health uh, and wellness masterclass in Laguna Cliffs, California, where Dr. Janos was a faculty speaker in our special session about challenges and solutions in lipid lowering therapy in women. So Eugenia, you gave a great talk as always. And for those that might've missed it, I was hoping we can go over some of the key takeaway points from your talk. So I thought you could start with what can clinicians do better in assessing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk in women across the lifespan? Thank you, Erin. And first I wanna commend you on the conference just because it's such a beautiful overlap between the two fields that we're both passionate about, women's heart disease and prevention. Um, so it was really, really exciting to be there. Um, so yeah, so I think there's so many areas that we missed the boat with women's heart disease and prevention. Um, and our session was really focused on lipidology and, and recognizing lipid disorders in women. Um, and there's just so many areas that potentially we can, uh, we can target. So our own biases, do we, when we have a patient presenting to us for evaluation of symptoms or even for prevention, if the patient's a man or a woman, are we taking a completely different approach? Are we really aggressively looking into the symptoms, thinking about um, prevention in women from a very young age? So thinking about our own biases, perhaps, or those of other uh, clinicians, wondering about what is it on the patient side that is keeping them from filling these prescriptions? Because we know that number one, statins are not prescribed as commonly in women, a significant difference overall of about 67% in women and 78% in men. And in terms of guideline doses, um, we see even worse, 36% uh, in women and 46% in men. So really a difference. And, and in some cases, um, women are experiencing more symptoms of statin intolerance, and that may be behind it. Maybe they don't have a good understanding of what to expect or the importance of the medication. Um, so there's so many different areas of where we can target women going home with the right prescriptions, us considering the risk, educating the patient, and really thinking about therapies in the case of statin intolerance as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, I think this session really highlighted that LDL cholesterol and ApoB are prognostic of ASCVD risk in women. We see this from Mendelian randomization studies and from observational data. And furthermore, you know, the available evidence from randomized clinical trials of lipid interventions demonstrate that women of similar risk, you know, benefit similarly as men do from reduction of major adverse cardiovascular events with lipid lowering therapy such as statins and, and non-statin lipid-lowering therapies. And despite this observed benefit, as you just mentioned, um, women who are at risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease remain really undertreated. Um, so you've mentioned maybe a couple reasons why, you know, one of them was that women are more likely to have statin intolerance or report statin intolerance than men do. Um, maybe you can discuss some others, but, you know, what can we do to bridge this gap to get our um, high risk uh, women patients uh, to be uh, on a, a lipid lowering treatment as recommended by guidelines? Great question. The, you know, the first thing I think is starting earlier in women. So it's known that because of the fact that women have uh, estrogen early in life that is protective and generally speaking, present with heart disease at a later age because of this, um, that has actually led to this lag in treatment uh, where even myself, when I was in an early attending, it was uh, the, the philosophy was we'll wait until menopause. We'll wait until she's past her childbearing years. So I think on the physician side, on the clinician side in general, it's starting as early as possible, particularly in 
genetically uh, acquired um, lipid disorders. This is not something that is only going to um, present risk later in life. Um, wherever we can, uh, on a whole, really starting to prevent the entire process of plaque buildup early in life in a woman, as early as possible, is one of the things uh, that we need to recognize too, is that peri-pregnancy management is, you know, we essentially, I think also, you know, because of that, ignore and try to keep women off of all the therapies for all of the um, childbearing years, which is just not the right approach. We can both uh, treat early, maybe even more aggressively than in, in a man, knowing that we're going to have to stop at a certain time to allow the woman to get pregnant. Um, so taking a very different approach, and there are safe therapies during pregnancy if needed as well. And then another focus in the uh, menopausal years where, again, risk increases and many of these risk factors worsen. Um, so really one huge area is just on the clinician side, changing the entire approach to how we approach a woman with elevated lipids. Yeah, thank you. You highlighted some really good points. I think there's still this perception out there that women are um, at lower ASCVD risk at a given age compared to men and this female advantage about this 10-year lag. But as you mentioned, in genetic um, dyslipidemia, such as familial hypercholesterolemia, there is no female advantage that in the setting of FH, you know, with high LDL cholesterol from birth, that women, you know, if untreated, have the same early onset of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease as men do, the same age of onset. So there's no female advantage. And in fact, if left untreated, 30% of women with FH will have a myocardial infarction before the age of 60. So we do them a huge disservice and, and you know, destine them to, you know, early morbidity and potentially mortality if we delay treatment. So it's so important that we start treating early in these high-risk individuals. And, you know, although we talked about how women may have more statin intolerance than men and statin intolerance is a vexing problem in clinical practice. And whether it's real or do the nocebo effect, it still limits adherence. But, you know, the good news is that statins are no longer the only option we have for patients. And one of the things we really highlighted in this session were the non-statin therapies that can be added, you know, when uh, a patient hasn't achieved their desire LDL target with maximally tolerated statins alone. And we discussed azetamide and we discussed bempedoic acid, uh, the PCSK9 inhibitors and enclosurin. And really available evidence suggests that women benefit similarly to these therapies as men do. Uh, so I don't know if you have any additional comments to, to add about any of these non-statin therapies in women. Yeah, you do highlight, you know, a really important point that uh, we have finally, I think, come to a point where we understand even more across the board, men and women, that it's the area under the curve for your entire lifetime of exposure to the atherogenic lipoproteins um, that we need to um, alter. Uh, and I think more recently, I've been hearing uh, the term of endotoxin. We should view LDL and uh, lipoproteins as endotoxins, really. And the lower you can be exposed to them, really, the better you do in the long term. So this should be our approach for both men and women, like you said, particularly FH. Um, and the other is that the targets for cholesterol, both in primary, secondary, um, high risk have all, you know, they're continuing to get lower and lower for where we add on additional therapy. So really keep that in mind, I think, when you're treating patients. Um, but yes, it's, it's really nice that number one, we should be, you know, working with our patients and know how to have the statin conversation, you know, like, you know, if we don't want to leave you on this medication, we, if you're having true symptoms, you know, doc, we're, we want to be sure we just want to give you a shot, we can stop it, we can restart it, we want to try additional ones, etc. But many patients do fail. Um, and it is wonderful to have other therapies for bempedoic acid, the fact that we have a, a trial um, that, you know, really was balanced with enough women in it to sort of um, give us information on how to take care of these patients, almost 50% female and in the primary prevention setting, having tremendous benefits. So it's a huge, um, another uh, tool in our, our toolbox, uh, PCSK9 inhibitors, azetamide, um, and glycerin, all of which are, you know, extremely important uh, therapies. And in some patients, we need to go immediately to the second line agent um, when they don't tolerate statins. And for many of them, we are adding on agents anyway. Um, so it's just really nice to be practicing at this in this day and age. 
Yeah, to be thinking about combination therapy early, just like we do with blood pressure. Um, one other thing I really loved about our session is that we had the patient perspective. Uh, you actually brought one of your own uh, patients, uh, uh, came to our session and gave a, a wonderful talk about our own experience. And so I was wondering if you had any pearls or, or comments about patient communication, you know, shared decision making, you know, how you uh, get your uh, patient, you know, involved um, in uh, the conversation about their cardiovascular risk. Sure. And I would urge all of our uh, colleagues to go out there and just talk to their patients and get their perspective. I think it's so huge um, to be, because when you're practicing uh, in a way where you take that into consideration, you're far more likely to get the patient onto appropriate therapy. It's, you know, we have a ton of therapies and yet the majority of patients are not at goal and they're not on the right therapies, right? But if you learn how to have that conversation, figure out what the patient is valuing, um, really take their perspective and work with them um, in terms of the ability to reduce cardiovascular events, it's so much greater than any of the newer, you know, tools in the toolbox, just getting your patients to get on those medications. So, um, yes, um, Agnes Cechlewski, who is an amazing woman who, you know, wants to share and do what she can. She is a champion for the Women's Heart Organization. Um, and she is very vocal to the point where she'll just tell me, yeah, that's not going to work. Having that kind of conversation, no, don't. Don't even don't even go there. Um, but, you know, it's been wonderful to learn from her. And she's really learned through the fields of diabetes, high cholesterol, this and that, um, you know, how to really get herself optimized and lifestyle and um, sort of medical therapy. Um, so, yeah, it was great to hear her voice and to tell us as clinicians at the conference what we really should be focusing on. Yeah, I, th I think her presence really made it a very special uh, session and impactful for everybody that was there. So before we close out this recap, is there any other um, pearls or takeaway points you wanted to share um, that we didn't discuss already? No, I think I just highlight that approach that we talked about really starting very early. Um, and, and really thinking about it, you know, I, I always approach all of my patients nowadays, whether they come in for palpitations or chest pain or just for prevention, I really approach them from a residual risk standpoint. Where is it, you know, what am I missing? So for everyone, extensive family history, understanding their risk, lifestyle, assessing their lifestyle and understanding where the gaps are, um, starting early with appropriate treatments when indicated, um, managing them throughout their lifetime, you know, with consideration of pregnancy, of the fact that things may get worse in menopause and we need to optimize our treatments then. Um, and just keeping in mind that, you know, the lower the better for your LDL cholesterol over a lifetime is really the way to go. The last thing I would say is there was just a recent um, scientific statement out um, by ATBB uh, showing that low cholesterols and brain function that we don't need to be as worried as many you know people are about very low cholesterol. So I think the key is getting that LDL low early in life and keeping it that way is important for men and for women. Well, thank you. That's a great way to close us out. Uh, I want to thank you, Eugenia, Dr. Janos, you know, for being uh, a faculty in our program, sharing your expertise. I hope we can recruit you back for an upcoming meeting. And thanks again for joining me on this recap. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you for having me.